All right, guys, welcome back to uh, Machine Organization and Programming. Today, we're going to be talking about dynamic memory allocation, but I wanted to start first taking a look at Project 4. Let me jump over onto a CSL machine. Um, so I've gotten a lot of questions, a lot of emails, a lot of people came to office hours uh, about how to just get started on this. And that's a clear sign to me that I haven't done enough. When we went over GDB, that was that day that I was sick and I posted just a couple of reference videos and some like uh, tutorial. Um, clearly that wasn't enough. So I just wanted to jump in and uh, just go through those beginning steps, show you guys how to get started and kind of just take a look at this. So the first thing I'm gonna do is OBJ dump with the dash D option that will disassemble the code. And I'm going to, uh, I lost a letter there. Hold on, that was the letter. I need escape room, and this is getting redirected to escape room dump. Okay, so that runs. Now I can pull up escape room dump and just take a look at the um, assembly code after it's been disassembled. So over here on the left-hand column, I've got memory addresses. Then I've got the binary instructions here in the next column. I've got the translated assembly code in the next, uh, the rest of this stuff. Okay, so the kinds of things I can see, let me head up to the top, to the top, um, as I look through this is, uh, I'm just gonna scan through a bunch of sections at the beginning that aren't really relevant. I've got a printf there. Um, here's the start of the text section. This is gonna be where a lot of the uh, global variables are stored. Um, and then down, where does it start? Here are the functions that are available in the code um, that I wrote. So is number correct is gonna just test and see whether your combination number is matches what the uh, code is expecting. Um, we can see in here, we have comparison. Um, A call to is number correct plus 38. We'll come back to that in GDB. All right. Um, then we've got F0. This is the function that's going to check the first or generate the first number. F1, the second number. Um, F2, the third number. F3, so on, so on. F4 has a helper that gets called inside of it. So I'm going to need to do that. And then F5 has a. All right, and then here's main. Okay, now we got a lot of questions from students who did this OBJD um, escape room and just got started with this, but then ran into trouble of trying to identify what's going on here. The, so there's some setup to get all the, you know, the stack set up. We've got saving some registers here. Uh, they're getting pushed on the stack. We have a bunch of function calls to, uh, that are cryptic in a lot of ways. If you guys just run the code, uh, you know that it prompts you for some input, then it reads in some numbers, and then produces a, you know, um, a critique of how well you did. Here's another function call. Um, yeah, all right. But without knowing what's going on here, here's the call to F3, the call to F2. Um, it can be a little difficult to decipher some of these main plus OX F9. And decide you know what's going on there here's another jump okay so in order to take a look at these I'm gonna jump back over to uh, my console and then pull up GDB and just take a look at the uh, compiled code in GDB all right so first up um, I'm gonna turn on some options layout assembly and that's gonna bring up this view where I can actually see the assembly code now GDB is gonna go through and um, take a look at this and do its own translation. It gives us a little bit different display. Um, and again, here, uh, I'm looking at the main function right there, uh, but it still has all these main plus 40, main plus 88 style commands. Um, next thing I wanna do is I'm gonna set a breakpoint at the beginning of main, okay? And then I'm just gonna run. So the beginning of main is at address OX 1411. It's got that breakpoint. Run will advance the code to the beginning of that. And at that point, I've gone through all of the text in the um, uh, that dump file, um, and it's identified some places like printf. So now I can actually see the first thing that's going on here 
that first statement after we you know save the registers and set up the stack is that I'm calling printf to print out that prompt that asks you to put in some numbers. Uh, if you step through this, you can actually see when that's get when that gets printed. I'll take care of that in a second. All right, so then I can use the arrow keys to scroll down and take a look at some of the rest of these things. So as I scroll down, I can see I've got another function call here. This is the one that calls scanf. This is the setup above that to get ready for scanf. Um, scroll down a little more. Should have another function call to printf. That's just going to print out the numbers. Um, and then we're going to go through call all of the different functions. Uh, 3f4, f5. And then um, it's going to call is number correct. This is uh, going to go on in a loop and it just goes through and identifies um, whether you've got the right number or not. It's going to count how many that are correct. And then down at the bottom, we print out the results. Uh, how many you got correct? And I believe there's then a bunch of stuff just get ready to return to the operating system. Okay, so another thing I want to show you guys, I want to jump to function f3 real quick. So I'm going to set another break at f3, and then I'm going to continue. Uh, so I go through, it prompts me. I probably should have done this step through for a second here, but I'm going to put in my six numbers. And then it's going to jump to breakpoint two. Oh, the display got messed up a little bit. Hold on one second. Let me try this this way. Where we just break it F3. We'll run. So we'll stop there. Put in numbers. And now. There we go. OK, so now I'm looking at the beginning of F3, my function there. We set up the stack, we move some data around. And one of the things I've been getting the absolute most questions on, I think students are trying to walk through this code without ever looking in GDB and you know executing it um, just to see what's going on. I get a lot of questions about this iMol with only one operand. OK, uh, you can look it up. You can see exactly what it's going to do. But maybe a better way to learn what you're going on and just gather some tools that can be useful in the future you know when you get a real job and you're faced with this problem or a similar problem um is to just step through this code so to do that um i've got a couple of tools available to me i can get info info about frames and this will just tell me what's going on in the stack all right it's the top of a function there's really not much here uh so i've saved the instruction pointer so i know where to jump back um, and call the frame. So the next thing I'm going to do is set up the stack. So let's see here. Um, let me just call step i. And this will move that um, active line down. So now I've pushed the stack pointer on. And let's see if that's... Uh, now I can do info frames. Oops. Info frame. There we go. And that's going to get the information about the current frame. I've got the stack pointer here. And then um, local variables. Let's see. Uh, previous frame stack pointer is that address right there. Okay. So we've got that saved. And I can just keep doing that. I can do step I and move through the code and just watch what happens. Okay. Another cool thing that I can do is get info about the registers. Okay, and this is going to list out all of the registers with their current contents. Um, it doesn't fit on my screen because I've got it blown up, so when I record it's big enough. So I'm going to just continue and grab all of the registers. My advice here is to just grab screenshots, advance through one line at a time, get a screenshot, and then you can make a little slideshow that you can click through. Then will make it easy to see which register changed. Um, you can look the code up here as it's going by and see which registers change and just sort of follow along with every single step of this. Um, and when you get down to here, you can see exactly what's going on with this weird multiplication. Um, let's see, uh, what else can I tell you guys? Step I also takes uh, an argument and that's how many steps I'm gonna take. So this will do one, two, three, four, five instructions. Whoops, too many, too many. All right, uh, run. Start from the beginning. 
demo that. I typed it wrong. It's step I. Uh, and then we'll do six instructions. And now my layout is messed up again. I wonder if I do that. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Because I'll have to start up. I'm not sure what's wrong with my display. It could be the screen size that I've chosen to use. But, all right. Um, so as you guys are going through, I've also gotten a ton of questions about grading. So you guys are writing your own C code that tries to do this exact stuff. And then when you compile, you know, the, the instructions that you can see when you do the disassembly, when you compile it again, you don't actually get these instructions back um, from the C version that you guys write. That is totally expected. So I just want to be real clear. When we grade this, we're looking for a couple of things. Did you get the numbers right? Were you able to find the combination? If you need a hint there, at some point, every number it appears in a register. Um, some of them are pointer-based saves, so they're not actually returned. Um, so it's a little careful. It can be a little tricky to figure out exactly which number it is if it's not just stored in EAX when the function returns. Um, so get the numbers right. Next, we're looking for function prototypes. Uh, it's easily possible to figure out how many parameters there are because they're pushed onto the stack before, right before a function call. It's also easy to see what local variables are used uh, because the very top of these functions allocate space for local variables. Um, let's see. Does this one have that? I don't see it. Um, and then the other thing we're going to be looking for is each of these functions uses a particular scale, a set of uh, ideas. Structure maybe is a good way to put that. But the idea here is that, you know, like one of the functions has a nested conditional when I wrote it. There are an absolute ton of ways to write C code that does the exact same thing. You don't need to use a nested conditional. You can use a sequence of many conditionals that have different parameters. Um, for the, there's a function that, well, several places that have loops in them. All I'm looking for is that you have identified that there's a loop. Um, in general, C code, you know, I've got for loops, I've got while loops, I've got do while loops, I've got loops that just use if statements with go to's, I've got options there. But most of those are turned by a compiler into something that looks a lot like a do while loop with the condition at the bottom. If it's a while loop, it adds one more line that just jumps to the condition first. For loops are very similar. They like basically get turned into while loop structures with that jump to the condition. Um, so it's almost impossible to figure out exactly what I did. Um, and I'm not worried about that. What I'm looking for is that you understand what's going on and can produce code that actually does the same thing. Think about it like this. When I grade your code, I should be able to take my main function and just copy it over your main function. Um, I'll probably use the is entry correct too. Or is about number correct? So I'll probably copy those two functions and then I'm going to run your code and just see if the correct answers still work. I'm going to make a couple of changes to the numbers um, and then like the ones that use conditionals that take parameters and just see if you get, you know, the, the alternative correct answer. All right. Um, so those are the kinds of things I'm looking for. I'm going to look at your C code and see, did you use any loop? Whatever. It doesn't matter what kind. Did you use some conditionals in the function that requires conditionals? The one that requires a function call. Did you actually call a function? Um, so pretty straightforward on the grid, really loose. I'm just seeing, did you get the idea? Were you able to read this assembly code and figure out what's going on and see? Um, what else can I share? Oh, other ways to set breakpoints. Let me do this real quick. I can also set a breakpoint using the star notation. So star says I'm going to actually be giving it a memory address, like a type in 56556318. So OX. 5656318. Five, five, if I wanted to, whoops, 318. If I wanted to do that, it sets another breakpoint. Another way to set a breakpoint is to use the star notation again and then actually use this set of numbers. I don't need the angle brackets here. I can just do function f3 plus 35 ooh, plus 35. And that'll give me a breakpoint right here at this line. Um, I think that should be really great to get you guys started. Um, oh, I was going to mention, I, I forgot, this sequence of instructions near the end of F3 seems to be giving the most trouble to people. It's a complicated sequence. This was one line of code in my function that did some division. It doesn't actually do any division here. There's no idiv L uh, at all. Instead, what it's done is it recognized that I hard-coded the uh, denominator and then it's doing this sequence of instructions, a weird algorithm to solve for that particular division problem and only that division problem. But 
it turns into uh, you know a bunch of moves and multiplication, some shifting, some subtraction, to do the equivalent thing much, much faster. Remember that division uh, on a CPU is very slow. It takes, I don't know, something like 60 clock cycles. Whereas some moves, a multiplication, some shifting, subtraction is much, much faster. So the compiler has recognized that it can do this more efficiently using this sequence of steps. I'm going to tell you right now, don't worry about the division. Now, you can easily go through this one line at a time, um, implement each one of these lines in your function that does the same thing, and just use their weird algorithm for division. All right, I hope, I hope this was helpful. All right, I'm going to jump back over and start talking about um, dynamic memory allocation now. All right, uh, give me a sec. All right, so just a quick overview to start out. When we looked at the very beginning, that first lecture, I talked about the core structure. Um, we talked about programming in C, then we moved into programming in assembly and how the C code gets converted to assembly. Um, and now we're going to wrap up with the last, the last two weeks of class where we talk about system level things. Um, in this case, we're looking for um, things. what's going on when we run a, a single process, the extra stuff that goes on. You should be able to answer how does a single program run on a computer at the end of this course. That's the main takeaway. You know, we load the code. It executes one step at a time. The assembly gets turned into a binary executable when we compile it. Um, we learned how the assembly works so that the, what actually goes into the CPU for those instructions. Um, so a, a more complicated question is what happens when multiple programs run on a computer. Um, so we're not going to go into that very much. We will begin taking a look at operating systems next week. Um, but for a real in-depth uh, take a uh, look at what happens when I run multiple programs, I'm going to encourage you guys to go take operating systems. Great class. All right. Um, so, But anyway, we're starting systems, and we're going to be looking at dynamic memory allocation. I had a lot of choices for topics uh, and only a little bit of time, and I think this one will really contribute to you guys' understanding of what happens inside the computer. Um, we'll also be taking a look at cache memories in uh, the next lecture. Actually, I might break this into pieces. It might be two or three lectures from now. Well, we'll see. All right, and then we sort of went into, um, when we started talking about assembly, we looked at what's going on in the address space. So um, we have a section for the code up at the top. The data section is going to hold all of the global variables. We spent a lot of time down here at the bottom talking about what goes on with the stack. Super important for function calls. And now we're going to wrap up with what's going on with the heap so we're going to what we're going to see is that you know when we wanted data to be dynamically allocated uh, malloc and free provided us that functionality by reserving some space on the heap letting us do whatever we wanted with it we could reserve as many bytes as we needed we could return it when we're done we could use realloc to make it a bigger um set of reserved uh, block of memory um yeah, so anyway, the heap is basically just a free store of memory, and it's controlled by what's known as a memory allocator. Um, so we're going to go into what are the major issues with memory allocators. Uh, first up, there are two times uh, types of memory allocators, uh, implicit and explicit. So explicit is the one that we're going to be looking at in this class. This is the, what C uses. This is where malloc and free, uh, new and delete fall. Um, basically, it's a like a piece of code that's going to take control of the heap. When we reserve, you know, using malloc, it's going to say, okay, you can have these bytes. Here's a pointer to the beginning. And it's just going to keep track of what we've allocated and what we, you know, is still free so that it can continue to provide um, memory uh, as we request it and free it. Uh, you're probably more familiar with the implicit um, memory allocator. This is going to be a system that uses garbage collection where it's just going to give us memory as we need it. You know, I can declare an object uh, in Java. It's going to just reserve space for that object on the heap all by itself. When we're done using it, um, we can uh, delete it or in Python anytime there's no reference to an object. Every time we, we like remove the reference to an object, we assign it to something else. Uh, garbage collection happens automatically. Every time I delete an object, um, so, uh, but we'll be focusing, all right, one other detail, we're going to be focusing in general. There's lots of different um, memory allocators out there. In fact, a lot of programs will write their own memory allocator. 
They'll just use some uh, built-in functions to just grab an, the entire heap address space and take control of it. Um, we're going to focus it at the end of the lecture on what malloc and free are really doing. Uh, it's a complicated memory allocator system to provide a lot of efficiency. We're going to start with some very simple allocators and sort of build our way up. Um, so, And like I said, a lot of programs will write their own memory allocator to meet their own performance requirements. Think about something like a web browser. You know, if you just think about the way I use it, well, if when I think about the way I use a web browser, I probably have something like 15 tabs open. I've got my email for the course. I've got my personal email open. I've got Facebook open. I've got YouTube open. I've got Canvas open. Piazza's open. There's just a lot of funk, uh, stuff that's available that I keep track of. And my web browser is going to provide, you know, so if, say I open up Facebook. It's going to have some HTML text that as I scroll down is going to continue to provide me with more HTML text. Um, and so it needs to reserve space for that HTML and then it needs to make it bigger as I scroll down and have more things open. Uh, Facebook also has a ton of images, so it's got to reserve some space on the heap for each of those images. When I close that tab, it needs to free up all that space for all those images. Um, so it's going to be reserving space, it's going to be freeing space. And to be honest, I might uh, keep that web browser open for weeks at a time with the one exception that I have a Windows machine and that likes to frequently reboot on me and that's really the only time my web browser gets closed and even then it tries to remember what I had open so um, I'm gonna take huge advantage of that memory allocator f allocating some space freeing the space reusing the space you know if I if I have a block of freed space and I'm trying to store a smaller picture or maybe an HTML file where there had been a large picture how does the memory allocator fit that new request for blocks in the like spaces that are actually free so this is what we're going to be looking at today um let's see uh and some other examples I think I think that kind of gets the picture though if I just talk about a web browser um all right, uh, one sec. I'm gonna go make some slides and just, I think I, I wanna do a quick review of how Malik and Free are working for us. So let me, let me pull that up in a sec. All right, so just a quick review about Malik. Malik is uh, the memory allocator that's, uh, it's a library built into C. Um, I believe it's in, uh, what is it, standard lib? Um, anyway, the way Malik works, if I'm looking, so here I've got the function prototype, it returns a void pointer. A great way to think about a void pointer is it's not a pointer to nothing, it's a pointer to anything. And I'm going to cast that to whatever kind of thing I want. That's going to happen automatically. Um, so then the malloc just takes one parameter. It's the size t is basically a type def for an unsigned int. So it's going to take an unsigned int. And that's going to be the number of bytes that I wish to reserve. It's going to return a pointer to the very first address in that um, block of bytes that it's giving me. Um, and I can put in basically anything that fits into uh, an unsigned integer for the number of bytes I'm reserving. Um, and here's an example of how I might do something. If I want to create a pointer to uh, a block of memory to store four integers, um, I'm going to use int star p. And again, it's returning a void pointer, but this cast to the integer pointer happens automatically. I don't need to worry about that in modern versions of C. By modern, I mean like actually two or three decades modern. And then I just need to put in um, how much I want to reserve. It's very common to use size of and then whatever variable type I want. So I don't have to worry about what if in the future they change the size of the integer. Um, so I can just use size of int and the number of bytes I want. Um, an issue that you might run into someday is legacy code. In very old versions of C, uh, it returned a character pointer because a character is just one byte. It's returning a pointer to one byte. Um, oops, I, I need an underscore right there. I'll fix that um, for you guys at home later. Um, so if I wanted a pointer to an integer p, then I needed to do that cast explicitly. So this malloc was returning a character pointer. I needed to do the cast to turn this into an integer pointer. So just a heads up, you might run into that someday. All right, now free just takes a pointer and it, the memory allocator, you can think about it as a, like a black box. It's gonna keep track for us of whether a block of memory or a few bytes of memory are available or whether they've been allocated and they're being used by my code. 
So the syntax here is very simple. It's just it takes a void pointer, and again, that cast will happen automatically if I give it an integer pointer. Like my example here, when I'm done, all I need to do is call free with the parameter p. All right. Um, the question, though, is suppose over here I've reserved, what is this, 16 bytes? The size of an integer is 4. I've got 4 of them. How does free know how many bytes to allocate? I, I'm not telling it right here. Uh, so the memory allocator needs to keep track of that somehow. Um, and another issue that we might come in uh, contact with is how does malloc, that, that library, actually deal with these other functions that are available to it, like realloc. So realloc is the one that's going to take a pointer that I've already created using malloc and just make it bigger or smaller. It's going to say, I don't, you know, I just need to change the size of this. Um, and if it is available, you know, if there's memory uh, beyond that, because it's allocating a contiguous block, it'll just make it bigger for us. If there's not enough space, it'll find a new space and then copy over all of the data that we had in the original allocated space. Uh, calloc is going to just initialize everything um, to zero, so it's a little bit uh, more work for the system. All right, just a quick segment on a bunch of um, history behind how memory allocators developed. In the very first version of C, um, there were a number of functions that allowed us to control the, the heap um, and allocate memory on them. Uh, one of the early ones, um, we need to know how big the heap is. We need to know where it starts and we need to know where it ends. Uh, so one of the features that was provided was the break pointer. And this is just going to be a pointer to the very bottom address of the heap. Um, one of the challenges here is uh, it's really difficult to tell where the heap starts. And it's going to, this is a, there's a pointer here at the end of the code to the data and the heap section. Um, but this was kind of a challenge for programmers. So uh, there's a, a function uh, int break, uh, brk is pronounced break, that just takes an address. And this is going to move the break pointer, indicating the bottom of the heap, uh, to whatever address I've just given it. So it requires very low level details. I need to actually give it memory addresses in order to use this. Uh, this is no good anymore. We want to be able to take advantage of modern memory systems. Um, oh, and the return value was either uh, one for success, zero for failure. So it's basically, you know, C's version of Booleans. Uh, they improved it a little bit when they added the sbark command. So I'm going to flip back and forth here. Please notice that sbark is just going to increment um, the break pointer, move it down, and just say grab more space. There we go, up, down, reserve more space when I call sbark. This is going to return a void pointer, so it returns the address where break is. So um, this is available if I just use an increment of zero, it doesn't move it, and this is a way for me to get the value of the break pointer if I wanted to use break to um, the break function here to change the address, but that requires me to do the math when I can just give it the increment. All right, let me check my notes here. Uh, yep, break sets the end of the data segment. Heap and data were originally part of the same block, the data segment. Um, to do that, there's a challenge. We need to know the starting address. Um, return the pointer to the break pointer. Yeah, this was just really messy. It required programmers to have a really in-depth knowledge of very low-level issues. Um, and just a quick note, uh, early computers didn't have very much memory, so this was important to like not mess up. And if you guys are programming, if you're working on an embedded system of some kind, like the CPU that runs uh, you know, an automobile engine, may not have a ton of uh, memory available to it. So it's important to be really careful that you're not using too much. Um, and you may need to go back to something like this uh, for control of the heap. Um, or when you're using malloc, please remember if you're ever on an embedded system that if there's not enough memory or it can't find a block big enough to allocate to you, uh, malloc is going to return uh, a null pointer. So make sure and check your pointers. All right, so next up, um, just want to introduce the idea of a super simple memory allocator. Uh, this one has a bunch of problems, and we'll see those in a second, but I just want to walk through how this is going to work to give you guys an idea. And one of the first topics that I need to introduce is the concept of an alignment requirement. So um, most uh, architectures have this requirement that when I use malloc, when I reserve space on the heap, the pointer that's returned must be a multiple of some number. Eight is really common, 
At the end of the lecture, we'll go over to uh, the CSL machines and actually do a little experiment to figure out what they're using. Um, I think it's eight, but we'll find out. Uh, so when we reserve memory, um, let's just walk through this example. I'm going to do three memory allocations and then free. All right, um, I'm going to use this model that keeps a pointer to the next free byte as a way to keep track of where I'm going to be allocating things. So when I go ahead and allocate, do this first allocation, I'm just going to allocate four bytes right there on the heap and return a pointer to P1. I'm going to call it P1. So this looks like this. So the bytes that are allocated are known as the payload. I return a pointer to the very first byte. This would be byte zero in this case. And I'm just going to use very simple numbering. The heap will obviously start with some sort of 32-bit hexadecimal version uh, memory address. Um, and it's going to increment the next pointer. So this is the next available byte that's free. But I have this memory uh, alignment requirement that says I can't actually use uh, 4 as the memory address of the very next byte. It's got to be divisible by 8 for my example. So memory requirement is 8. Let's see. So next up, what that means is that this is where I can actually return the very next um, pointer when I reserve more space. Um, and this wasted space right here, I've allocated four bytes. This is the payload. This is the important part. This is the part the user is going to be using. This wasted space is just known as padding. And we'll see a number of versions where padding comes in um, during the course of this lecture. But uh, this padding right here to meet a lem uh, memory requirements is the first one we'll run into. Um, all right, so next up, when I do this second memory allocation, I'm going to be reserving eight bytes. So that's going to advance the next pointer, return a pointer to wherever next had been pointing, P2, and that's going to reserve eight bytes here, uh, payload for the user. All right, and then got a typo. Timeout. All right, got that fixed. This had said 12, I had intended one. All of my pictures that I made in PowerPoint are for one byte, so I went ahead and fixed that. Uh, I'm waiting to confuse anybody. So um, next up for P3, I'm just going to reserve space for one character or one byte here. I'm going to return a pointer to that. So this is going to look like this. So P3 is actually going to be pointing to this one byte right here. Uh, I've got the arrow just to be lined up, but it's just pointing to byte, here we got 0, 4, 8, 12, 16. And um, the rest of this because the memory alignment requirement says the next pointer has to be on some multiple of 8, so it'll be pointing to the 24 block right here. Um, I'm only using one byte for my payload, so I've got three bytes here wasted in this piece, and another four bytes wasted right here. Okay, now next up, if I were to free some memory, and this particular model doesn't have a good way to do that. I've got the challenges on two slides from now. But if I were to free it, it's just going to go back and leave... Uh, a big hole right here, for available memory, but because I'm using this next pointer model, it's a lot like a stack, uh, this next pointer is just going to keep advancing and it won't go back and fill that in if I have another request to malloc 8 bytes again. It'll put those next 8 bytes uh, over here where the next pointer is pointing and advance that next pointer. So we're going to run into a number of challenges with this super simple memory allocator. Uh, there's no built-in system to free things. If I free P2, um, it doesn't have any idea how many bytes there are. See, just it just gets past the pointer. I have not recorded anywhere in the memory allocator how big P2 was, so I don't know how many bytes to return. Um, it's going to leave holes behind that we're not going to ever go back and fill in. And the last challenge is what happens when we get to the end of the heap? Um, eventually, we'll run into the stack. And we would like our memory allocator to discourage overwriting the stack. We've already seen with uh, buffer attacks in the last um, uh, lecture that that can be bad. So a good memory allocator has a number of requirements that we really do need to meet. If it's going to operate continuously, like the way I have my web browser open for weeks at a time, um, and continuously dealing with new requests, new web pages, new images, freeing those when I close the tabs, Okay, so here's the idea. Um, we need to do six things. First, we're going to need to keep track of the size of blocks for freeing them. We already have pointers to where the blocks are, like P1 here points to this first uh, zero block. All right, uh, so it's easy to figure out where I need to start freeing stuff because free requires that pointer. But I need some metadata. 
something to keep track of how many bytes I need to free. In this case, I would want to free eight bytes, four for the payload and four for that padding. Okay, uh, next up, uh, I need to be able to deal with requests in any order. I could have, uh, you know, malloc p1, malloc p2, malloc p3, free p2, malloc p4, free p1. They need to be able to come in any order. I can't guarantee that they're going to be matched up or paired or nested, you know, malloc in a function and then free it at the end of the function. No guarantees. And in fact, I can't even guarantee that memory that I've allocated will be freed. Uh, programmers are notoriously bad at memory management. It's, it's really difficult to get right. Um, so I need to make sure that I keep track of um, uh, or, or just be able to accommodate any request for memory and any free request in any order. I'm not allowed to, yeah, in fact, that's the next point. I need to do this immediately. I'm not allowed to buffer the requests. I'm not allowed to reorder them, even though that might make more sense for alignment or, you know, if I've got a hole that's exactly 16 bytes and the first request that comes in is for one byte and the second one is for 16, that 16 byte request would fit in the hole perfectly. Um, I'm not allowed to do that one first. I've got to deal with the one byte request first. I need to make a decision about where I'm going to put that before I ever even look at what comes next. So I don't even know what's coming next. So I'm not allowed to buffer. I'm not allowed to reorder them. All right, another requirement is that I'm only allowed to use the heap for storing all of this metadata. It's got to go on the heap. I'm not going to reserve space on the stack. Um, I'm not going to have like treated as function calls where I'm um, yeah, you know, using the, the stack from all of this needs to fit in the heap. I also have block alignment requirements I need to meet. I've already talked about that. My example here is using alignment requirement of eight bytes, and that's why I ended up with this padding. Here I've got, you know, um, four plus three, seven bytes of padding because this was just one byte. Um, and next up, or, or finally, I guess, I'm not allowed to modify any of the allocated blocks. So check this out. As I left off my heap, I've got eight bytes right here that are available. I'm not allowed to say, let's take this one and just move it up. That's going to give me a large block that's available. I can then accommodate any you know new request that's larger than, what have I got? Uh, four, eight, uh, here's four, eight, twelve. Um, I'm not allowed to accommodate any request that's larger because I can't move these around. These have been given to the uh, programmer. The programmer is using them. They've got pointers to them. And the uh, memory allocator doesn't have the power to reassign pointers to those things. We're not going to mess with the user code in any way whatsoever. All right. So some of the goals, um, we want to be able to maximize the number of requests per second. And these requests are requests to allocate memory and requests for freeing memory. So if I can do 1,000 requests per second, uh, that would be my the idea of my throughput. Um, some of the challenges here are... If I get a request, I may need to search through the heap to find a block that's big enough. Um, so that's going to be uh, where uh, the placement of block, the placement policy. Each of those are going to have different time requirements depending on how I try and choose where to put something. All right, and the other thing I want to do is to maximize uh, memory utilization. So right now, in this block of memory, here's the next pointer. I am using four bytes here. One byte, five bytes total out of 24 bytes that have been allocated, zero through 23. Um, not so good. I've got a lot of padding. I've got some free space in here. Um, <clears throat> so the idea uh, of the memory allocator is that I want to minimize the amount of padding that I'm using. I want to minimize the holes that I'm leaving behind. If I can fill this in with something, I get better memory utilization. And I also want to keep the metadata, this metadata up here from keeping track of the block sizes, I want to keep that to a minimum. So I want to have just uh, the least amount of wasted space possible. Um, and these, this wasted space is known as uh, fragmentation, and it comes in two different kinds. Now, the internal fragmentation is really easy to think about. It's just <clears throat> how many blocks have I really allocated? There's one here, four here, five total out of 20. Um, that's internal fragmentation. It comes from uh, basically two places. Uh, the minimum block size rules. So this is going to be, uh, I haven't talked about this yet. So this is the idea that a memory allocator might say, okay, you're asking for some memory. We're only going to give it to you in certain minimum block sizes. You know, you might request four bytes, but we're going to say you have to take 64. 
And that's going to, you know, one reason you might do that is because when you free it later, it's going to keep larger block sizes available. Um, something like this would probably be a special situation where I may be using like a, <clears throat> a, a graph where I have nodes or a linked list with nodes where the most common size is 64. So I might find myself allocating blocks of 64 over and over and over again, but then I might use it for a couple other things. And so if I have like a couple of allocations where I've just uh, gotten one integer or a couple of bytes uh, for a small array or a struct or just even one character, that's going to leave behind all these little holes when they're freed, when those functions end and I use free. Um, so uh, they may say, okay, we see that this is going to happen. We're going to use block sizes that have 64 for our nodes frequently. We're just going to set that as the minimum size so that you know when you free your integer later, uh, it still leaves behind a hole that's big enough for our most common piece of data. All right, so that's one rule we might see. And, and in a way, this is why I'm talking really generally about how memory allocators work instead of diving in specifically to what malloc is doing because there's a lot of like homemade memory allocators out there where people have done something special to get better performance. All right, um, and the other source of internal fragmentation is these alignment requirements. So here I'm wasting four bytes. Here I'm wasting seven. Okay, that one's pretty straightforward, I think. All right, the other idea is external fragmentation. This one is a lot harder to measure. Basically, the idea here is that I have enough free bytes total. So this model has four here, four, 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 eight, oh, wait, is it? Four times four, 16 bytes total. But because memory allocators give the user um, memory in contiguous blocks, if I request 12 bytes, even though that's easily available, I've got that much free, I've got 16, um, there's not a block with contiguous, you know, all right next to each other, but it's available to accommodate that request. So this is going to be an example of external fragmentation. A little harder to quantify. It's hard to say, you know, whether I've seen enough, uh, fra you know, how do you, how do you put a number in that? How do you measure it? All right, let's see. Um, right. So now that we've got our requirements, our goals, so the implementation of memory allocators really needs to do, uh, we've got to deal with four issues. First, we need to be able to track the free blocks. And the next strategy I'm going to talk about um, is the idea of a free list. Basically, we're going to keep a linked list of and track whether a block is free or available and how big that block is. Next uh, issue is the placement policy. So we'll need to go through um, that free list when we get a request for more memory and find the absolute best place to give the user memory. Um, depending on like the size of the request and the size of all my holes available. There's a number of uh, different placement policies out there that are widely used, and they have different um, performances depending on the kind of input they're getting. So you might, um, this is another reason you might see homemade memory allocators rather than just using malloc. If you know what kind of you know requests you're going to be getting, web browser, for example, might have a lot of image requests and a lot of HTML requests, um, you know, requests to allocate memory for those items. Um, we might want to use a certain policy to make sure that we minimize the amount of fragmentation. All right, uh, next up, the idea of splitting. How do we take care of the fact that, you know, I might have a block here that has, you know, 64 bytes available, and I want to allocate 32. So that's going to mean that I've got a payload uh, allocated block with 32 bytes, and then I've got another block that's still free, but it's now shrunk in size. So we need a way to keep track of blocks that have been split. And uh, I might choose to put my allocated block at like the beginning of that free space or the end of the free space. The middle wouldn't make sense because then I've got uh, even more fragmentation. But so how do I want to split? What am I going to do there? And I'll just do one example of uh, uh, putting that uh, allocated block at the beginning. Um, but that you might choose to put it at the end if I expect the previous block to be freed sooner than the one behind it, depending on the usage of my model. Um, and then that leads me to the idea of coalescing. So suppose, for example, in this model, I freed P1. That's going to give me a free block here with eight bytes total. Um, and then I'll have another free block immediately behind that, also with eight bytes. I need to merge those together and recognize that the contiguous free area right here is actually 16 bytes that I have available rather than two blocks with just um, 
eight bytes total each. All right, next up, I'd want to introduce the idea of an implicit free list and just go through some of these ideas about how we can keep track of how many bytes are used so that when I go to free something, I know how much memory to free. So this idea is known as an imp implicit free list. Uh, all of the metadata required is going to be stored right on the heap. And I want to just do this as uh, by way of example. So I've got the exact same example I did at the beginning. We'll walk through this using the implicit free list rather than just putting everything in order um, that you know had all those problems. Okay, so here's the idea. My very first malloc, I'm going to grab four bytes of payload and return a pointer to it. Now, when I did this the first time, I put it in byte zero. In this case, I'm going to reserve some space right in front of those allocated blocks for a header that's going to keep track of how many bytes I've used. All right, so, and I also need to return a pointer that's a multiple of eight or divisible by eight so that um, <clears throat> to meet that memory requirement memory alignment requirement. So P1 is going to go right here at 8. The next thing I'm going to do is go ahead and add in my header. So this header, in this case, um, is going to be uh, just a da data point that tells me how many bytes I've allocated. It includes the size of the header. So the header is going to take up 4 bytes, payload 4 bytes. So it's going to have 8 bytes total. And then it's going to have a second piece of data also in the header. This is just a flag. It's going to say 1 for allocated, 0 for not allocated. Um, so in this case, I can, uh, I've can i gone ahead and uh, I really should have had a header at the very beginning of my first slide, but I wanted to introduce the, is this idea in a little bit different order, starting with the payload at byte 8. Um, but originally there would have been a header back up here uh, at the top saying that there's um, 56 free bytes. Yeah, that's divisible by 8, and they're all free. Yeah, so it would have been 56 slash 0. So I've got the payload. Uh, my header goes immediately before the block. Uh, 8 because I've got 4 bytes here and 4 bytes there. Then the next header will be for the free block. So I've got 0 as my flag saying all of this memory, the blue memory here, is still available. And there's 48 bytes, uh, including the header. I think I got that right. Yep, uh, 48 is divisible by that. Okay, then... Um, please notice that because of the way this worked out, I, my first um, pointer needed to point to something divisible by 8. I've got 4 bytes in front of that for the header. The 0 block here, 0, 1, 2, 3, is always going to be unused with this implicit free list model. Um, Alright, so then when I go and do the second allocation here and generate P2, I have a pointer to P2. Um, that needs to point to a memory address divisible by 8, so it's going to go on 16 right here. My, huh, I'm getting eight bytes of payload, two, four. The next um, place that I can allocate memory is going to be on memory address 32 because I'll need to save room for the header in front of that. So this will give me some padding. <clears throat> so I'm going to be wasting four bytes here. Um, in the first model, I didn't waste um, bytes on this particular one, but I wasted bytes on the first one instead. So the payload is in a different spot here. All right, and so I've got 16 bytes that I reserved for this block. There's four for the header, eight for the payload, and four for padding. And this is now allocated. So I've set my allocated flag um, just one bit to a one in this case. And then the remaining 32 bytes are all available, so I've set those to zero. Um, that flag right there. Then when I come back and allocate P3, so I've changed this header now. Um, the next available spot is byte 40 for the next pointer. Um, so that means I'm going to reserve one byte here at 32 for the user. I'm going to have a bunch of padding, in this case only three bytes of padding, and the header for this block that's going to begin at 40 comes right before that, so that'll appear here at address 36. And I've got 24 remaining bytes available, so zero for available, 24, that's how many bytes I've got left. Um, <clears throat> And this header plus the four bytes here for payload and padding makes eight bytes total. All right, so three examples of alloc allocating memory with malloc. A um, couple of things to notice, just some patterns. This header value is always going to be a multiple of eight because of this alignment requirement. So eight, 16, 24, 32, 48, 64, 
128, um, whatever we end up, 256, it's going to be a multiple of 8. All right, <clears throat> um, next up, when I go back to free, this is really easy. So let me see right here. I've got a pointer that points to this payload. I call free on it. The size of this block is in the byte immediately before this. So all I need to do is go back up here to this 12, uh, memory address 12, and I need to change one bit to free this. So I've got a 16 here uh, with a flag of one saying it's allocated. All I need to do is change that flag to a zero. And now these um, bytes are available for, for use. All right, last topic for today, or for at least this video, hopefully I'll have time to record the other one this afternoon after office hours. Um, but here's the idea. How do we go ahead and pack all of this information into the header? I need to know how big this allocated space is, in this case, eight bytes, and whether it's um, allocated or free. So either one for allocated or zero for free. Now, here's the idea. I get four bytes to work with, and I'm gonna take advantage of the fact that the size must be a multiple of eight. So the size is gonna be um, eight, 16, 24, 32. And in hex, uh, 0008, 0010, 0018, 0020, okay? And when I write these out in binary and actually look at the bits, I only need one bit for either a one or a zero. Um, I get these bit patterns. So eight is gonna be 0000, 1000. Take a look at this for a second. There's a pattern here, okay? Uh, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. And that pattern is that the last three bits of every single number that's a multiple of eight are going to be zeros. So I can take advantage of these. Um, in this case, for this implicit free list, I'm only going to be using uh, the B0 bit for that flag. I'm just going to set this to 1 if my block is allocated, 0 if it's not. Um, other um, memory allocators will take advantage of the other two bits to do special things, like, uh, for example, track whether the block in front of this one is allocated or not. Um, that's going to be important for merging things together. Okay, so take a look at this. If it's an 8-0 flag, that means I've reserved 8 bytes for this block, including the header, and uh, it's free um, because of that 0. I'm just going to use, uh, let's see, a 0 in that B0 spot. So my... A uh, flag when I record this in binary um, and then uh, stored in memory is going to be 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, which is just 8. Okay, even number. Um, if it's allocated, I'm going to just change that very last bit to a 1. So I get 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1. So 9 in this case. Um, and it's an odd number. The 16 uh, oh, that I used to have, I took it out uh, when I did the uh, free P2 demo. But if in the original version, it was 16-1 when I'd allocated it. So 16 is going to be 1 here. The dash 1 means flip that um, B0 bit to a 1. And I get a total of 17. This bit manipulation of that final B0 bit can be easily done with um, just uh, bitwise AND and ORB operators um, to just grab that uh, flag bit to decide if things are available or not. Um, actually, I'm going to do one more thing. I want to talk about the largest possible piece of memory we can allocate. One second, I'm going to make one more slide. All right, one final slide. Uh, uh, how big is the largest possible block? So I've got four bytes here for the header. Um, in binary, the largest possible number I can pack in would be all ones. But remember, these headers, uh, the, the amount that I can allocate needs to be a multiple of eight. So these last three bits will always be zero. So turn that into hex, I get FF, 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 F8. Uh, I just real quick grabbed a converter tool from Google and converted that to about, what is that? Four billion bytes. So a lot of memory. Um, yeah, so that's the largest possible one we can, we can use. All right, and uh, note, it's not the largest possible value of an unsigned integer. That would be... 2 to the 32 minus 1. We don't quite get that much. It's almost that much, but a little bit short. All right, uh, looks like the time says 1.57. I've got office hours. Um, it's probably going to be busy today, just looking at the last couple of days. So I'll be back at 3 to <coughs> edit this video, and then I'll get it up as soon as it's ready.